Okay, welcome back everyone to Peeling Sid Barrett. This will be episode 35. And in this episode, I want to cover three things kind of roughly. I want to discuss the song Opal. I want to discuss the story of Have You Got It Yet? And uh, perhaps you're familiar with that story, but uh, if not, then we'll become familiar with it through this episode. And the last thing I want to discuss is Carl Jung. And obviously, Carl Jung is a very complex topic. I am not going to go through by any stretch of the imagination, all of Mr. Young's ideas. I'm just going to kind of pick a few from the Red Book and we'll try to weave all these together into a, a somewhat intelligible, semi-logical story. Uh, these things and these ideas are loosely connected in my head and so I want to try to present them to you as a form of a story and perhaps uh, it'll be worthwhile and it'll be enjoyable to listen to. So, uh, those are the three things I want to cover, and I guess now let's run through our corrections and I guess you could say mistakes from previous episodes. The first one isn't really a, a correction uh, or a mistake, it's something I left out on purpose. And that is, from our previous episode we were discussing Wolfpack, and one of the lines is Diamonds and Clubs, and they're discussing Wolfpack. Now, uh, I did cover two of the ideas that are possible there. One is diamonds and clubs may be related to some kind of patches for youth club organizations that are called a wolf pack. The other one is, of course, that there could be a, uh, a reference to tarot kind of suits, uh, suits of a deck. And the third that I didn't mention, but I had been thinking of, is that uh, diamonds and clubs may actually be a representation graphically of a wolf. Uh, wolves have pointed ears, pointed teeth, their feet are clubby. So um, uh, the reason I didn't include that is, of course, that I don't have any artwork of wolves by Mr. Barrett. Uh, we do have uh, artwork of, of the lions, which we discussed in um, episode four with Peeling Sid Barrett, the Boy and the Lion. And you can see he has these kind of angular drawings with uh, clubby feet and, and angular teeth. And perhaps that's a reference to diamonds in clubs or the nature of the ferocity of that interaction. And of course, lions in, in that case, in that painting, didn't necessarily just mean lions. They meant many other things. So perhaps that's what's being referenced is uh, the oncoming whatever that vehicle is of destruction and death, which could be referenced in Wolfpack for obvious reasons, since that may be a song that is, is discussing the nature of passing information back and forth between this world and some other spirit world or something along those lines or memory or whatever whatever you choose to think it may be a representation of but the diamonds and clubs may be of course be a, a, a reference to uh, the very uh, in, inevitable nature of nature that eventually we all have to walk through that door and so perhaps that's what's being referenced. I don't know. You'll have to decide on your own. Of course, with Mr. Barrett, a lot of times he does more than one thing at a time. So he may be doing all three of those things um, on purpose or subconsciously. I don't know. But uh, they're all possibilities in my mind. Uh, the other thing that I would like to call out is uh, sometimes I go back and I look at old episodes. And there's a reason for that, <laughs> um, which might not makes sense to everybody, but uh, it is funny to me to listen to some of the older episodes, and some of them I'm, I'm really proud of. I think um, I, I managed to capture some really uh, interesting and cool ideas about Mr. Barrett. Some of them haven't been as good, but certainly they are all done. And uh, we are approaching kind of the end of my review, at least of Mr. Barrett's work, in what I consider to be a full and comprehensive and considerate way, which... I, I hope is something that uh, he and um, whoever his relatives are would approve of in some way. Uh, at any rate, uh, I, I went back and looked at the discussion on CM and Play for a very specific reason, and that is because I kind of was a little bit dismissive of the video that was released by the band and officially by Pink Floyd for uh, CMLE play where they're just kind of miming playing playing on their instruments and they're doing some miming things all in black and white of course what I would like to point out of course is that there is a lyric in Wolfpack about 
uh, bowling and batting, which are cricket references. We referenced those cricket references. But what I did not note at that time, of course, is that in the video for Sam Lee Play, they mime playing cricket. Now, of course, uh, you could say that bowling they bat as a group. That's the line from Wolfpack. You could say that, of course, cricket is very popular in England. A lot of people could reference cricket. I won't deny that possibility. Uh, it is a little bit odd to me that I can't think of another Pink Floyd song that references cricket. But there in Wolfpack, Mr. Barrett specifically is calling out cricket. And they definitely are playing cricket in the song for CM Lee Play. And you would have to admit that CMLA Play was their biggest hit up to that point in time. And Mr. Barrett, it basically belongs to Mr. Barrett. I mean, he's the one who put most of the ideas together for that song. So did he put together ideas for that video? And if so, um, you know, what, what are the implications of that? I also would like to point out that, uh, and I don't know if I did this in the video, but uh, throughout that CMLA Play video, uh, in the very beginning of it, I believe it's Rick Wright, he goes around and he touches people and they become animated. And I just want to point out, again, there is the reference to the power touch or power talk H uh, possibility. And, of course, that would be the idea of transferring life to, to inanimate objects, which could be a religious kind of a religious kind of a meaning. Uh, I don't know. You have to decide on your own. But I think it's worth going back and looking and noting those two specific things if you want, you can go back. I'll, I'll link, of course, Pink Floyd's official version of CM Lee Play. Now, the last thing that I want to point out is that uh, there was a person who commented that my microphone is, is not too good and that uh, I, I sound a bit uh, remote or perhaps uh, the, the, the quality of sound isn't the best. So uh, here's the background for that. And um, I, I am aware that, of course, that I, I load these kind of quietly so the, the volume is a little bit low because that's what I would want if I was watching. I don't like really loud, clear noise. Um, that's just perhaps my, my preference. And so I've tried to do these in a way that I would like. And hopefully it's at least getting across some of my points. At any rate, um, I, I've tried three microphones. Two were low, low range and one is medium range in cost and they all were terrible. They were worse than just using my regular desktop uh, microphone. So I'm just using the regular phone, a uh, microphone that comes with a computer. And that actually has come out better for me. So I'm, I'm kind of sticking with that. I do apologize if that's bothering some people, but uh, overall, I think the quality of these videos is determined by the material that we're discussing and the points that we make and the considerations that we make and uh, the connections that we make and not necessarily in the and I've discussed this before and the really flashy photographs and all this other stuff that are using other people's material and uh, I, I, I didn't want to have to get into that and I didn't want to bombard people with this really uh, really excited pushy kind of language uh, because I don't like that when people talk to me and I don't like when I watch videos like that. I'm making a video that, again, as I said, is, is in a format that I would appreciate and have respect for. And hopefully there are other like-minded people that feel the same way and, and, would, uh, and appreciate these in the format that I'm doing them in. So anyway, that's, that's all for now. I'm, of course, I'm always happy to have people view and give comments. And uh, even if the comment is simply, you know, the sound isn't what they like, uh, that's still a totally valid comment. And uh, I do appreciate when people take the time to listen to the videos and make comments. So um, that's appreciated. I will point out that I, I, I don't have very many subscribers. And if you're not aware of the YouTube uh, method of actually paying people, you have to have a thousand subscribers, which I'm nowhere near. I, I, I don't even have 10% of that. And I, uh, I am getting pretty close to being about halfway for the viewership in hours that's required to actually get paid for putting out videos. And again, I don't even know if I deserve to get paid. I'm just discussing uh, Mr. Barrett and his work. And so I'm discussing somebody else's work. It's very odd to me to think that some people would think they deserve to get paid by using other people's material or discussing other people's material. Uh, I guess it would be nice to get 
paid for that, but in a way, I, I definitely don't think I deserve to get paid just by discussing other people's work. Uh, perhaps, in a way, I'm, I'm discussing it and adding more dimensions to it, but again, overall, I mean, who would think that they deserve to get paid for something like that? Anyway, uh, that's just kind of a side thought. But I'm nowhere near actually ever getting paid, and <laughs> I'm kind of into this for a year now, and uh, still nowhere near. So I, I don't know. I mean, they, I don't know how they want to, how they determine what they want to do, how they produce things, and how they're going to actually reward people for putting in the work and effort of making something that is uh, worthwhile and positive in scope and format. But uh, I, I, I've. If you haven't been able to tell yet, I, I've kind of given up on that. <laughs> I just have a message uh, that I hope is going to be a counter message to this, uh, I guess you could say pop message of what Mr. Barrett was and who he's, what he stood for and what these things were that were being made and that he was just someone who went crazy and did a lot of drugs and all these things. Uh, I mean, all of that is being pushed by other people and uh, it's very exciting and people want to listen to it because they seem to have this kind of mad fascination or, or this kind of morbid curiosity with people destructing and, and I really don't like that. Uh, I would rather choose to focus on the positive aspects of the work that he made and the person himself. Anyway, I've talked long enough about those. So let's get into our discussion. <clears throat> uh, if you would, I'm going to link Opal, the song Opal, uh, O-P-A-L, which apparently is noted in the lyrics of Sid Barrett, which was just released recently. There's a little comment that at the bottom of the page, and this is on page 77, that the original uh, mislisted this song as Opal, spelled O-P-E-L, but it's actually supposed to be O-P-A-L. I don't know how they came by, by that information. Now, this is by Omnibus Press, lyrics of Sid Barrett. I've called out this book before. I'll do so again now. Uh, again, I don't recommend that book for everyone, but uh, if you are interested in the very specific nature of the lyrics of Mr. Barrett, and I, I don't know if I agree totally with all the lyrics in here, I don't know how they collected them and clarified many of the lyrics, but uh, that's, I think, our best bet for, for knowing exactly what the lyrics were, perhaps, that Mr. Barrett had put out. So, uh, basically, I'm going to link an, uh, a lyric version of Opal. Uh, I would like you to really pay attention to the music and the meaning and the theme of the song. And then I'm going to suggest Roger Waters' uh, Edgington interview again. And at 31 and a half minutes about there, Mr. Waters relays the story of Have You Got It Yet? which uh, And I'll allow him to describe that in his own words. So those two things, check them out. If you're already familiar with the song and the nature of the song, and the Edgerton interview and the story of Have You Got It Yet, then never mind, we'll, we'll just keep going. But I'll suggest that you kind of put this on pause, maybe check out those other two videos and then come back. And, and I'm going to discuss some of the, I don't know, synchronicities, the, the, the kind of odd connections between these two stories or the song and the story. And uh, then we'll discuss them kind of to try to get a feel for what might be happening. At any rate, uh, check them out, and I'll come back, and I'll talk to you in a little bit. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to check out Opal. So the first thing I want to do is discuss the kind of the, the feel of the song. And that is uh, pretty, uh, I guess you could say, it has a certain unease emotionally. It is a little bit spooky. I, I don't know exactly how to describe a lot of the emotions that uh, I, I connect with this song, but it certainly does seem to be discussing kind of negative topics, and we'll get into that later. There also is this kind of constant key changing that Mr. Barrett is running through while he's running through the, um, the chorus of trying to find you and living and doing these things the right way, etc., and the reason that I, I mention that is, of course, because of the song or the story of the song, Have You Got It Yet? Now, uh, some people have kind of in, intuited, you know, what the nature of that is. And Mr. Waters discusses it kind of going, have you got it yet? Dump, 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 have you got it yet? So kind of upbeat. 
uh, and that this just seemed to be kind of like a really uh, I don't I don't want to say a wicked joke but a very uh, wonderful joke and uh, kind of a I guess you could say a little bit of a twisted sense of humor now I did just do a video about uh, a painting of Mick Jagger and uh, I did a guitar cover of Wild Horses and to give you a feel for this kind of twisted sense of humor I did an intro to that video I'll suggest you check it out see how many jokes I have put in the intro to that I, I've deliberately made like first and second level I guess you could say meta metaphorical kind of jokes that I get that I don't think most people would get one of them the easiest one obviously is that the date is wrong it's not 1888 BC that uh, Van Gogh painted uh, <laughs> painted the painting it, it's impossible it's 1888 AD but a lot of people because of the tone of my voice and my delivery will take that introduction as being gospel they will believe what I am relaying to them and I want to encourage often I, I do this to people um, <laughs> Uh, my brother and I talk about these things a lot but uh, and I was talking with him about making that video and I couldn't stop laughing and of course he's he, <laughs> he's telling me the whole time like most people aren't gonna get these jokes and I, and, I, and I said yeah that's that makes it even funnier to me and it's hard to describe exactly how funny why is that so I don't know but it is and it's something I've done since I was a kid I, I like to make jokes like that, that, that people don't get. And uh, at any rate, the Have You Got It Yet song reminds me very much of that sensation. I do wonder if, you know, this isn't just some deliberate uh, long form prank that Mr. Barrett has put together just to kind of mess with people. And there are various reasons why someone might do that. Of course, he might be pointing out that you're not as accomplished as a musician as you think you are. You don't know how to navigate key changes the way I do. So that might be a kind of an attack in a way. It, of course, could also be completely nonsensical and impossible to follow, even for an accomplished musician. And in a way, that is somewhat funny as well. What I want to point out is, of course, that it is possible that that actually is part of a song that was released. And that may be this song. He may have been running through the key changes that he uses in this song, Opal. This is the song that I notice has quite a few strange key changes in it that sounds similar to that story. At any rate, uh, that's enough of the feel of the song, but let's discuss the actual lyrics of the song, okay? So let's start off. There's mention of things being on a distant shore and miles from land. So in other words, this is on an island. It's far away. It's separated by, of course, water. Here's another reference to water, a separation of things with water, and of course there are... Uh, many myths and stories of uh, islands, uh, the islands of the dead. Uh, supposedly it's it's tied up in the idea of King Arthur where he just was sent in a ship after he died to an island. I can't remember the name of that island. At any rate, let's continue on. There's an ebony totem and ebony sand. So sand is rhyming with land there. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of alliteration here so far. Distant shore. Uh, of course, distant and land, which is alliteration, and then stand and sand and totem. So there is quite a bit of, of the TD alliteration in the first two lines. The third line is a dream in a mist of gray. So there again is the D and the T alliteration on a far distant shore. So more DT alliteration. So very far away and there again is a, a reference to mist of gray and of, and we've mentioned the use of mist misty gray misty writers that have been used by mr barrett and other songs as well and of course the reference to dreams which we've mentioned before as being a psychedelic like type of uh reference for traveling uh, of course uh dreaming flying a uh, trip these are all kind of psychedelic references, and I just want to point out, of course, they don't have to be purely psychedelic. A person dreams many times, and some people apparently dream quite a bit and have dreams that they believe to be quite meaningful. So this may be purely a dream. Okay, so uh, let's move to the next verse here. 
there's a mention of a pebble that stands alone. Okay, so we know that Mr. Barrett has stood alone, uh, and perhaps that's a reference to himself in a way. There's driftwood that lies half buried. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, F driftwood lies half buried. That's a very pleasing combination of words phonetically. Uh, at any rate, what is driftwood that could lie half buried? Uh, that unfortunately could be a reference to a person. Um, there are, of course, many connections between wood or trees and people in, in many mythologies. So the idea that you have driftwood or remains of a person, remains of a tree, so therefore possibly the remains of a person that is half buried. So not totally buried, not totally forgotten, but still somewhat revealed. The next line is a line of genius, in my opinion. Warm, shallow waters sweep shells. So S and W alliteration throughout. Warm, shallow waters sweep shells. To completely beautiful. A very, very beautiful line. What could it possibly mean? Uh, why would it be a warm, shallow water? Uh, shells, again, are remains of creatures, so they may as well be bones. So why are warm, shallow waters sweeping bones? Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, this could be a reference simply to the island that spirits go to. And the cockle shine. Now, cockle, I believe, is a form of a shell. <clears throat> but there is quite a bit of... Uh, notice that shine doesn't rhyme with shell, but it has a pleasing form of phonetic connection to the word shell and shine. Okay, let's move on to the next. <clears throat> the next verse is a mention of a, there's a bear winding carcass stark. So carcass stark, of course, is alliteration. Uh, I don't know why the, why the carcass is winding. I don't know what is meant by that. Uh, perhaps there's some definite, I'm not going to look it up. If I can find one, I'll put it up here that I'm going to look through some definitions of winding. If I can find one that seems to fit, I'll, I'll kind of notice that. I'll note that. And it's shimmering as flies are scooping up meat. Okay, so there again is a reference to flies. We've thoroughly discussed flies in a number of Mr. Barrett's songs. An empty way. Uh, what is the empty way? Uh, the way of nothingness, the way of emptiness. Uh, perhaps a reference to, of course, um, dying or the way that people go when they die. The next uh, line is dry tears. Okay, so now we get into part of the reason why I chose to do this after Wolfpack, of course, because because Wolfpack also makes reference to tears, although they are not tears in the past. Tears, the life that was ours, is the, is the line in Wolfpack. So that's present tense. Now, in Opal, they are dry tears. In other words, this is past tense. This is something that has happened in the, ha in the past, and those tears have now dried and gone. Crisp flax squeaks tall reeds. I have no idea what's going on there. Uh, but again, you can get the hard K sound, um, and the flax squeak tall reeds. Hmm, I don't know. It's an interesting combination of words, but really I can't get much out of it. And they're making a circle of gray in a summer way. So there again is that mention of a way. What is the summer way? Uh, a round man. Summer way, of course, the time of summer is during the height of life. So why there is this circle of reeds um, of gray? Of course, reeds are not gray, they're green around man and then stood on ground. I don't know. It could be perhaps a reflection of life, so therefore it's gray. And then comes the, the chorus, which is that repeating with the key changes of trying to find you, trying to find you, and living and giving. Okay, so living and giving. So living, of course, would be a reference to living in a certain way. Giving, what would be giving? I don't know. But, of course, the song Bite constantly mentions giving things away. And uh, that someone is the kind of girl that uh, would fit in their world. And they can have everything if they want things. So here again is the idea of giving, giving away what? Giving away things. So, uh, now, I will mention, of course, that 
religiously speaking, um, that used to be a very, very important part of, and, and I guess in some ways it is, in, um, especially in a lot of uh, Christian belief sets. But um, not just giving money, but giving very personal things uh, and giving time, quite importantly. So uh, I do wonder if this isn't a way of Mr. Barrett saying, of course, that he is giving the things that perhaps would be an indicator to purify the soul. Why would they need to purify the soul? Um, perhaps because they are trying exactly to find someone. Who would they need to find that is no longer available? Well, at the time this song was recorded, and I, let, give me just a second here to look this up. This song was denied uh, release for a very long time. And it, for, for whatever reason, either because, um, either because it was considered to be inappropriate or because perhaps people simply didn't want to release it, uh, I don't know. You'll have to decide why you think this song in particular would be blocked for so long. Now, I challenge you to tell me that this is a bad song. Uh, in my opinion, this is a wonderful song. It is incredibly, incredibly personal and revealing in many ways. And you have to wonder if perhaps it is being blocked or wasn't being released because it is incredibly personal and is revealing many things about Mr. Barrett. So uh, let's see. We have here a release date of October of 88. It was rec recorded at Abbey Road from uh, May of 68 to July of 1970. And it was released on the Opal album in 1988. So... Basically, 20 years after this uh, after this song was recorded, it is finally released. Why is that? What is in here that perhaps may not want to be released? I, I don't know. You'll have to decide on your own. But it definitely does seem to give some of the indicators of what may have been motivating Mr. Barrett. What may have been motiva motivating Mr. Barrett? Well, uh... There are only so many people that I guess you could say had gone from Mr. Barrett's life in 1968 to 1970 that he would not have been able to find. So that uh, obviously everyone loses people, but who would you be trying to find? Uh, I would argue, of course, this could be again another reference to his father, Max Barrett, as we just discussed in Wolfpack. So uh, perhaps the... The emotional impact of his father's death is being relayed specifically within this song. The motivation, what he's trying to do, and we've noted that there's an esoteric or religious aspect to Mr. Barrett, which seems to be self-delineated, a kind of combination perhaps of Christian and Eastern ideas, or whatever he could piece together to try and perhaps uh, find his father or connect to his father, or perhaps discuss uh, things with his father in some way. And many cultures have wanted to do this for many, many thousands of years to try and contact people that uh, they were close to that are no longer uh, with them. And there, are, of course, are many, many rituals for doing such a thing uh, that is, or, or at least used to be fairly common. And I think now people would say, no, that's not a good idea. At any rate, that may be what is happening in the song Opal. Uh, that's just my take on it. But, and you'll have to kind of decide on your own. So uh, I guess the part that I kind of would like to discuss now is to just kind of flesh out this idea of why someone would want to do something like this and what is trying to be achieved. So um, now this is going to be kind of, this will be kind of the hard part. I... I preempted this video with a quote by Carl Jung, and that is, of course, that he mentions his development of uh, the Red Book, which uh, is really like Libra Novus and is a collection of black books. And you can read about all this. And I, I will mention that there is someone who makes videos. His name is Uberboyo or something like that. He extensively discusses many aspects of Carl Jung and the Red Book and many, many kind of um, important things that have to do with Carl Jung. Now, I'm just going to describe a, a few things about Mr. Jung, about Mr. Jung from the Red Book. And before I do this, I want to mention the important, uh, important um, 
theory of individuation by Mr. Carl Jung. And I'll give you a definition of individuation here. Essentially, <clears throat> and Carl Jung, of course, was deferential to Friedrich Nietzsche. And I, I'll get into Nietzsche eventually. I hope to anyway, at some point in time. But the development of the, of the actual spiritual person so that they can kind of rise above the limitations that are being imposed upon them by a society or religion, these are discussed by Nietzsche. And of course, they're also discussed by Carl Jung. And Carl Jung defers to Nietzsche, and I think you'll see why here later. Now, as Mr. Uh, Jung was developing Liber Novus, or the Red Book, <clears throat> uh, a lot of people now say, well, he, he must have gone insane. He had kind of a break. Now, I, I want to give a little bit of history, and that is that I believe this was started in around 19, 1909 to 1913 or something like that. It was after a break with Freud, and he decided he would kind of go on this self-discovering journey to examine his own psyche or the aspects of his mind that he felt were trying to speak with him that he wasn't necessarily in control of. And there are a lot of uh, ideas that kind of tie in with this that I'm not going to go through. I'm just going to give you a few quotes from Mr. Carl Jung. At any rate, I want to point out that he did this, and some people said he may have had a schizophrenic or a psychotic break, but he continued to practice, and people didn't really seem to notice that this was affecting him outwardly. So he was able to control this process to some degree, so you have to wonder um, exactly how, I guess what you could say, exactly how crazy was this, really. I also want to point out that Carl Jung was quite an influence upon the Beats, or, or uh, the Beat generation. He was an important uh, kind of an authority figure for them and helped develop the philosophy. And I just want to point out again that quite a few people mentioned the impact of psychedelic drugs, etc. upon the development or being able to break a person's perception of the way the world is and the way the world should be and who they are and the way they should be. But here's Jung going through this process without the use of psychedelics. He is doing this through his own form of self-analysis. So, in my opinion, of course, and I've stated this before, a person does not have to go through that process. And in a way, I'm worried that people think that you have to uh, have this kind of a break that's brought on by psychedelic use to actually achieve a refinement of the spirit or soul. Again, these are just my opinions, uh, but that's actually debilitating. You do not have to, in my opinion, imbibe drugs to actually have a revolutionary change in your outlook on life and um, within yourself and on your place in the world and the way that you wish to function in the world. It's something I believe you can accomplish uh, on your own by being honest with yourself and going through a process of self-reflection. This is demonstrated by Carl Jung. Okay, so let's go ahead then and move on to the Red Book itself. And I, I just want to mention a few things that, uh, that I've noted here might be important. Okay. So the first is re-finding re the soul. Uh, and here's what Mr. Young has to say. When I had the vision of the flood in October of the year 1913, it happened at a time that was significant for me as a man. At that time, in the 40th year of my life, I had achieved everything that I had wished for myself. I had achieved honor, power, wealth, knowledge, and every human happiness. Then my desire for the increase of these trappings ceased. The desire ebbed from me and horror came over me. The vision of the flood seized me, and I felt the spirit of the depths, but I did not understand him. Yet he drove on with unbearable inner longing, and I said, My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak, I call you, are you there? I have returned. I am here again. I have shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet, and I have come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. So here is this connection between Carl Jung and his soul. He has gone through 40 years of life and he has recognized that the things that he thought were important to him are not actually important. That what is important to him is a connection to his own soul. Let's continue on. And I just want to point out, of course, that uh, uh, there are numerous kind of indicators towards things or the trappings of the material world that Mr. Barrett has made as well. And there also are numerous esoteric statements within his songs. From Soul and God, 
Carl Jung says, Like a tired wanderer who had sought nothing in the world apart from her, shall I come closer to my soul. I shall learn that my soul finally lies behind everything, and if I cross the world, I am ultimately doing this to find my soul. Even the dearest are themselves not the goal and end of the love that goes on seeking. They are symbols of their own souls. My friends, do you guess to what solitude we ascend? Hmm, quite interesting, isn't that? The solitude that Mr. Young is willing to go through to attain a connection to his own soul. Uh, further on, the spirit of the depths even taught me to consider my action and my decision as dependent on dreams. Dreams pave the way for life and they determine you without you understanding their language. One would like to learn this language, but who can teach and learn it? Scar scholarliness alone is not enough. There is a knowledge of the heart that gives deeper insight. The knowledge of the heart is in no book and is not to be found in the mouth of any teacher, but grows out of you like the green seed from the dark earth. Scholarliness belongs to the spirit of this time, but this spirit in no way grasps the dream since the soul is everywhere that scholarly knowledge is not. In other words, and forgive me for interpreting, I'm really... I think sometimes I shouldn't be interpreting. It's it's self-evident really what the man is relaying here. But the idea of what we would consider to be rational versus irrational thought, this use of the dream within a person to reach self-fulfillment cannot be explained in a completely logical way. It may have been in the past, of course, a very spiritual thing. And of course, may have been tied to other forms of religion. Um, in some ways, I guess some people would say it still exists there in religion. For me and my experience, my experiences with organized religion now is it, it is not participating in that specific process. Just my opinion. So uh, on this, let's continue on then. Uh, on the service of the soul, now he discusses the very the different variations of the soul. And uh, I'll, I'll just kind of point these out. If you are boys, your God is a woman. If you are a woman, your God is a boy. If you are men, your God is a maiden. The God is where you are not. So, it is wise that one has a God that serves for your perfection. A maiden is the pregnant future. A boy is the engendering future. A woman is having given birth. A man is having engendered, etc. So, essentially, there are aspects of ourselves that are not known to us any longer, that are almost like reflections or shadows, is a term that is often used, of ourselves. And in understanding the knowledge of that relation, ideally you'll establish a connection with your, with your soul. So uh, I just want to point out, of course, there's an inversion there. We've discussed repeatedly the nature of Mr. Barrett's uh, reference to sexual inversion within his songs. I don't know, of course, that he was uh, interested in Mr. Carl Jung or in the Red Book itself, but I will point out that many people knew about the Red Book. And I just want to point out, of course, that the Red Book was not actually published to the public until much later. And I'll see if I can get a date for you here. Um, 2009. But this book, the Red Book, was well known by many people. Many people had discussed things or aspects of it with Carl Jung. He had very likely shown it to people. And it is, as we've discussed in the film The Shining, you can see it when uh, Jack Nicholson first walks into the hotel's room to be interviewed by the hotel manager or owner who looks like John F. Kennedy. You can see the large red book there, which is an obvious nod to the red book by Carl Jung which establishes, along with The Catcher in the Rye, the idea that the, the movie, the film, The Shining, is very specifically going to be taking on the mind. So, <clears throat> let's continue on. On the service of the soul, on the following night, I had to write down all the dreams that I could recollect true to their wording. The meaning of this act was dark to me. Why all this? Forgive the fuss that arises in me. You want to do this. What strange things are happening to me? I know too much not to see... On what swaying bridges I go, where are you leading me, etc. So he's following some kind of an idea 
that's tied within his dreams, but he's not entirely certain where these ideas are going to go. Uh, there is also a note here, and I'll just kind of um, point it out, that in Black Book 2, Jung noted uh, a voice kind of talking to him and saying, Nietzsche did this better than you. You are imitating St. Augustine. So even he was aware that a lot of these ideas had existed for some time. And again, he is an influence on the beat poets and the beat generation to a large degree. So uh, I think he's worth reviewing. Okay, let's continue on. The desert. Sixth night, my soul leads me into the desert, into the desert of my own self. I did not think that my soul is a desert, a barren, hot desert, dusty and without drink. Uh, the journey leads through hot sand, slowly waiting without a v visible goal to hope for. How eerie is this wasteland? It seems to me that the way leads so far away from mankind. I take my way step by step, and I do not know how long my journey will last. So again, here's uh, a reference to the desert. There are many references within uh, Judeo-Christian uh, traditions of journeying through the desert, uh, from Moses to Christ himself spending time in the desert, and here again is this idea of spending time in the desert to kind of come to grips with the desert of the soul. Um, why that's being made, I don't know. Uh, page 238, this is how I overcame madness. And this is from uh, Descent into Hell in the Future. If you do not know what divine madness is, suspend judgment and wait for the fruits. But know that there is a divine madness which is nothing other than the overpowering of the spirit of this time through the spirit of the depths. Speak then of sick delusions when the spirit of the depths can no longer stay down and forces a man to speak in tongues instead of in human speech and make him believe that he himself is the spirit of the depths. But also speak of sick delusion when the spirit of this time does not leave a man and forces him to see only the surface, to deny the spirit of the depths and to take himself for the spirit of the times. The spirit of this time is ungodly. The spirit of the depths is ungodly. Balance is godly. So this idea of balance between uh, the spirit of the depths and the soul and the world, this balance is what is being referred to as godly. Uh, now Jung is kind of dangerous to a lot of people because he is combining this idea of unscience with science. And I would argue, from my, and I've told you before, my background is very scientific. Uh, <clears throat> to a large degree. My personal background is not, but my professional background is extremely science related. And I can see the value in uh, many of this, if, if not taken to a, a form of absurdity. But this idea of balance between what is irrational and rational, what can be proven and what cannot be proven, and uh, making good financial decisions, but also making good spiritual or soul decisions uh, are that really needs to be balanced in a lot of people's lives. And I see all around me people only making decisions that are um, financially driven. Or they have, I don't know what percent you want to say, but the vast majority of people to me make decisions based on very cold facts. And uh, that's a little bit unfortunate. Perhaps it's something that needs to change. Perhaps it's time for people to start doing that. I don't know. So I'm continuing on to the splitting of the spirit, murder of the hero. But on the fourth night I cried, to journey to hell means to become hell oneself. It is frightfully muddled and interwoven. On this desert path there is not just glowing sand, but also horrible, tangled, invisible beings who live in the desert. I, don't know, I didn't know this. The way is only apparently clear. The desert is only apparently empty. It seems inhabited by magical beings who murderously attach themselves to me and demonically change my form. I have evidently taken on a completely monstrous form in which I can no longer recognize myself. It seems to me that I have become a monstrous animal form for which I have exchanged my humanity. This way is surrounded by hellish magic and invisible nooses have been thrown over me and ensnare me. But the spirit of the depths approached me and said, climb down into your depths and sink. Uh, so through this process, of course, is the nature of changing uh, through this kind of a spiritual path that Mr. Young has tried to describe. And it is, uh, I guess I, I guess you could say somewhat terrifying. And quite a few people have dis discussed the nature of that um, with, within their own psychedelic experiences. And perhaps that seems a bit negative, but I think uh, the process itself 
of recognizing uh, attachments and being able to change. And of course, there are many mythologies uh, with people changing shape um, to become part animal. We've mentioned the many animal metaphors within Mr. Barrett's music. Uh, there's a very long Greek mythological tradition of that very subject. <clears throat> and of course, these can mean very s specific things uh, symbolically. And hopefully I will remember, I need to discuss the symbolic meanings of opal. Okay? I'll do that right after we finish Jung. So here is a resolution from Carl Jung. Okay? It's uh, from his uh, book on resolution. May the fruitfulness become so great that it can turn men's eyes inward so that their will no longer seeks the self in others but in themselves. In other words, we're not trying to identify ourselves through other people's eyes. Only through our own are we identifying who we are and what makes us valuable. I saw it. I know that this is the way. There is mention of the way. And the way, of course, is repeatedly mentioned by Mr. Barrett. It's mentioned here in the song, The Empty Way. Here is another way that was, I guess you could say, discussed by Mr. Young. <clears throat> I saw the death of Christ. I saw his lament. I felt the agony of his dying, of the great dying. I saw a new God, a child who subdued demons in his hand. The God holds the separate principles in his power. He unites them. The God develops through the union of the principles in me. He is their union. So there is this internal process that is generating balance and becomes godly. And this is the idea of the death of the old God that is discussed by Nietzsche when he says God is dead. He doesn't mean necessarily that the idea of God is totally dead. He's, he's, he's subduing an older form of God and trying to bring it to some newer form. Now, Uber Boyo, uh, as I mentioned, does a lot of uh, videos on Carl Jung. Uh, he also does Ion. And if you haven't studied Ion, you can read Ion. And the various changes, of course, that are possible uh, to Christianity and, and the interpretations of Christianity through Carl Jung, who considered himself obviously to be a Christian, and so did Nietzsche in certain ways, uh, or at least the spirit of that, if not in the, I guess you could say, in the kind of dogmatic, s slavish kind of following uh, that's provided through a ritual and a literal translation and many, many prayers. I can't remember uh, the name of that very specific portion of the Bible where it says they think they shall be saved for their many recitations or something like that. I'll put that on the screen here. But essentially, uh, the idea that this is to be internalized, that these ideas are to be internalized, and in doing so, in combining these, and generating, and becoming an individual, <laughs> and, and, and individualizing, uh, you actually achieve something that is quite godly. And um, for many people, that's the, the entire point of everything, is to eventually be able to say, no, that's right because this or that. For example, is it correct or is it good or bad to kill? Of course, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. What is meant by thou shalt not kill? In order to live, you have to eat. And in order to eat, you must kill things. So if you take a very literal translation of that, uh, I don't know how you're going to live. There are ways, of course, to eat things without killing the total of it. For example, if you dig up a potato, you cut half the potato, you replant half the potato, you eat the other half, which interestingly is something that a lot of uh, people used to do in, in older cultures. They used to dig up, say, a, a root uh, collection and they would replant some of the root, which of course allows them to use it continuously, but also saves the plant. It doesn't entirely destroy the plant. Uh, at any rate, you have to decide what does that mean. Of course, many people interpret that to mean you, you shouldn't commit murder, which is a very, in my opinion, that's one redefinition of the word kill. What is meant by murder? Is it just within your own culture? Does it also include warfare? All these things can be debated. But until that struggle internally has been discussed, and a person looks inside themselves and individuates, it's very, very difficult to say that you have in my opinion, a strong standing of who you are and what you believe in. And that process enables a person to become empowered and know who they are, what they stand for. And that's really what 
ties in with so many other values of life, not just the way that you're going to live your life, but also how do you discuss things with other people? How do you view people as equals if you haven't be, if you haven't even gone through the process of teaching yourself how to value, value yourself? Um, and of course, everyone should value themselves. And we intrinsically know that as, as humans. We all know we should value ourselves, but not everyone has gone through that process. Not everyone has been taught to go through that process. At any rate, uh, Carl Jung is really tricky and a lot of people avoid him. Uh, for various reasons and as I've mentioned before I consider myself to be a Christian though I'm not affiliated with any church I refuse to be and part of the reason is because uh, perhaps I've gone through my own form of individuation and although I value very much uh, Christianity and uh, Christ himself I do not believe that I should be a part of any form of dogmatic pursuit at any rate uh, that's quite a long discussion so what I would like to do, lastly, is read you a few quotes uh, from, or a few ideas anyway, I should say, from uh, Mr. Chapman's book, A Very Irregular Head, okay? And I'm going to indicate kind of why I want to discuss these as we go. So the first one that I want to discuss is, um, let's see, I thought I had these all kind of Put together really well but now I'm seeing that I don't so uh, one of the things that I want to put to your mind real quick is an interview by Rosemary Breen about her brother and uh, about his work and I wrote it down but I can't really see it now at any rate one of the things that she mentions is that uh, it's kind of he may have been a little bit sharp or short I can't understand exactly what she said with people but it was hard for him to talk and of course, it was hard for him to interact with society. And there are various reasons why that may be the case. But I just want to point out that it is possible that Mr. Barrett may have been going through this Jungian process of individuation and separation from society. And uh, a lot of people don't recognize that as something that would perhaps be um, causing trouble with uh, being able to talk with people. But it is... Uh, difficult, I, I would think, for some people to, there's almost like an antagonism between people who are individuated and people who are not. And people who are not don't seem to realize that they are antagonizing, antagonizing people that are. They can have just very mundane, casual conversations. They don't realize that that, that can be uh, harmful or distressing to people. Um, who have gone through a process of individuation. Uh, I don't know that that's what's happening there, but I, I just want to point out that, to me anyway, that that is a possibility. So I, I do suggest that you watch her interview. Now, here are a number of things that kind of came up that I that I read that are, are interesting to me. Now, um, one of the things I would like to point out is on page 411, uh, Rosemary relays that uh, Mr. Barrett had a very kind of whimsical sense of humor, a very dry sense of humor. I tried to relay that, as I said in my video, uh, for uh, about my painting and uh, of Mick Jagger and the song Wild Horses. It's a very dry sense of humor, and of course it's also twisted in a way that most people won't understand, and in a way that makes it even funnier. So. Uh, Miss, Miss uh, Rosemary Breen does seem to mention that there is an aspect of Mr. Barrett that a lot of people don't seem to recognize. I just want to point out that that is possible. Another thing that I want to point out is on page 403. I won't list all of these things, but a listing of books after Mr. Barrett had passed is noted, and a number of them are psychiatric books, and which indicates, of course, that Mr. Barrett did have an interest in psychiatry, psychology, etc., so he may have been quite knowledgeable on uh, Carl Jung. In my opinion, people don't just uh, go through like one week of interest, or certainly not a person like Mr. Barrett. If he was interested in the psychology, he would have quite possibly um, been interested in that specific topic for quite some time. And we as outsiders would have no idea again of what was going through his mind and what he was considering as he was kind of uh, navigating his own life. Uh, let's see if I can find here some more kind of ideas. 
that relate to our discussion today. Um, on page 57, uh, I have previously discussed this. On page 57 is the mention of the, of the nickname Fred for none other than David Gilmore. And there is a reference to a letter that was written to a certain someone. And Mr. Barrett specifically notes that he did not have faith in his uh, vocal abilities, musical slash vocal abilities. And he says, basically, Mr. Barrett says, he would, but he can't get Fred to join the group. Fred is, of course, a reference to David Gilmore. David Gilmore had his own band and they were touring. So this is long before... This is in 1964 time frame. You can tell that Mr. Barrett already is thinking about replacing himself with David Gilmour. And as I have mentioned before, I used to be quite upset, and I should mention this here, that uh, they just re-released Momentary Lapse of Reason. I'm going to check it out. I haven't checked it out yet. Uh, but they just re-released Momentary Lapse of Reason, which is, of course, David Gilmour's big coming out album as the driving force behind Pink Floyd after Roger Waters was out. And when I was younger, I resisted that album and I resisted David Gilmour because I had loyalty to Roger Waters, which I now realize was ill-founded. In my opinion now, David Gilmour was the savior of Pink Floyd and he was the person that made all of this music possible. You can argue from what I just gave you from this book that it was all put together by, by Mr. Barrett. He recognized his own limitations, his own uh, desires to be removed, and uh, he recognized also the possibilities of combining the band with David Gilmour. And so he sought, perhaps sought to do so. You'll have to decide on your own. Okay, um, here is another item from page 71. Is a, a very specific person relaying their impressions of Mr. Barrett. And uh, they mentioned that he is very uh, kind and generous, but also very um, uh, nice person, but also a very solitary person mentioned that he would just come in and go right to his painting and wouldn't really talk a lot with people. He was not what they considered to be a really jolly or a social person by nature. And this is, of course, when he was young. So many people that mentioned that he changed over time, I'll point to that and say uh, that, well, there's, there's an indicator right there of someone's testimony that uh, he perhaps was... He was perhaps like that the, the entire time. On page 129, uh, there is a very specific mention that Roger Waters was barely competent on bass. I have also heard or read somewhere that Mr. Barrett used to uh, tune Mr. Waters' guitar for him. Uh, now, I won't say that that means necessarily that Mr. Waters was incompetent. I will say that it is possible, of course, that uh, Mr. Barrett was changing to odd keys or odd tuning, and Mr. Waters wasn't able to follow that. You have his own testimony in the Edgerton interview that he wasn't able to follow Have You Got It Yet, either because Have You Got It Yet is nonsense, or because Roger Waters simply wasn't able to follow what, what, what Sid Barrett was doing. And of course, if Mr. Barrett, uh, if, if the stories I recall of Mr. Barrett perhaps um, tuning Mr. Waters' guitar early on, would be an indicator that perhaps Sid is using uh, some different types of keys that are difficult to follow along with. Okay, two things to finish up and then I think we're done. The first one is uh, the nature of the title of the song, Opal. Uh, this is from uh, Opal Burstone. Uh, it's on uh, opalauctions.com. I don't have anything to do with them, but it's hard to find like definitions of what opals might mean. Of course, you're wondering, Opal is a birthstone, and it's a birthstone for December, or uh, October. So, uh, was anyone, was uh, perhaps Mr. Barrett's father, Max Barrett, born in, in, in October? No, he was not. So, uh, I don't really know if this is a reference to, of course, a birthstone, but what might Opal actually represent? Now, the name Opal actually apparently is derived from Sanskrit, Upala. So, uh... There's an Indian reference, again, from India, and we know, of course, Mr. Barrett was into yoga. So is he interested in opal because it may have a connection to um, to, to uh, the history of, of uh, the Indian people or to Hindu religion? I don't know. 
It also apparently is related to uh, a Greek derivative of that same word, which means a change of color, because of course opal has many colors within it. Uh, opals they mention have been said to help family members find their family members find their way home for reconciliation. Very interesting. Was uh, Mr. Barrett aware of that? I don't know. Uh, it's highly regarded in many ancient cultures, including the Hindu, the Greeks, and the Romans, for its powers of foresight. And we've mentioned before the traveling backward and forward through time, being able to see as being something that is, that is referenced often with, within Mr. Lyrics, uh, within Mr. Barrett's lyrics. Uh, they are um, symbols of ever-changing fortune and healing. Um, a connection to the understanding of higher powers, a safe traveling charm, and is called the Queen of Gemstones. Interesting, of course, there's another royal reference queen. Now, uh, I don't know if any of these things are known by Mr. Barrett or deliberately used by Mr. Barrett, but I do know, and I would like to note, that within the book, Barrett, uh, are a number of gifts that were given by Mr. Barrett to a certain someone, and one of them is a white glass ball, and the other one is a kind of a candle in red and gold uh, together with a with a, a kind of a stone. And these were accompanied with paintings. Why these colors were chosen and why the combinations, even the person who received them doesn't seem to know why this was done. Uh, I'm just including those because <clears throat> there's an indication of crystals and of stone. And here we have a reference to crystals and stones, so perhaps Mr. Barrett was considering those things as well. Uh, it's really hard to know without a direct uh, testimony from, from Mr. Barrett himself. So uh, that's pretty much it for everything that I wanted to cover. Hopefully you understand now why I wanted to tie all these things up into one episode and how they are loosely related. Uh, the last thing that I will do is run through our counts, and we haven't done this in a long time, but our themes, our thematic counts on Mr. Barrett and I'll update them for our last three songs which I haven't done in a while and there really isn't a need to keep doing this at this point I think you can tell which ones are consistent with Mr. Barrett himself. Uh, male female inversion I have by eight. Uh, sexual metaphor innuendo I have by I have by eight. King Queen Royal I have by six. Young uh, slash animal metaphor I have by sixteen. Shy, dismissive, misogynistic uh, tone, I have by 7. Lost love or torn attraction, I have by 20. Uh, changing religious or esoteric beliefs, I have by 11. Alienation, separation, by 10. Drug, psychedelic, or trip reference, uh, by 11. Colors or slash paint references, by 16. Uh, flying or traveling and sleeping, uh, by 10. Hidden sorrow, I have by 14. Sun, stars, planets, I have by eight. Low, high art combinations, I have by five. Uh, Joyce, Shakespeare, Tolkien references, I have by eight. Planning, I have by three. Science, I have by two. Abbreviation, nicknames, I have by five. Uh, Velvet, uh, Do Velvet, Underground, Dylan, The Doors references, I have by six. And then childhood references, or back to childhood references, I also have by six. So, um... I guess that's that's pretty much it. I'll just explain now what I intend to do moving forward. Uh, there are two more episodes of Peeling Sid Barrett, and I unfortunately now realize that there actually is a much better title for this series that I should have used, but uh, it's too late now. And I'll reveal that later on. Uh, hopefully. But um, I will probably finish up Peeling Sid Barrett in two more episodes. And then I'll do a conclusions and perhaps interpretations. For example, I want to examine these, this theme listing and say kind of what might be happening with this theme listing. Why is he choosing these themes, etc.? What does it mean? And uh, I will continue on with the Did Sid series. I don't know how long that's going to be. I, I, I know I want to go through the wall because uh, I, I rec with Pink Floyd, I recognize Sid's influence through the wall. After that, I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, I do also want to try to tie him with other artists to see if they were influenced by him or perhaps may have worked with him to some degree. It's hard to know. How many of them I'm going to do, I don't know. I can think of uh, three kind of off the top of my head that I want to kind of examine. But altogether, that's maybe, I don't know, maybe eight more episodes. After that, I'll go through and uh, I'll just be doing kind of my own thing. And 
perhaps that's good. You know, that's my intent is to tackle this, peel it, understand it as much as possible, and then uh, move on and and uh, live my own life. Hopefully you will as well. Uh, hopefully this helps you kind of give value to your own life. It gives insight into uh, ideas or things that perhaps you can do and you can create uh, uh, dreams, the importance of, of our own dreams, the importance of our own uh, revelations so that we can live a full life. And uh, I think perhaps that's what Mr. Barrett was going through. Perhaps, as I, as I mentioned, I go through this and I kind of try to understand these things as I'm talking through them. And of course, some of the earlier stuff perhaps isn't as good. Um, some of it I, I do like. Some of it I think I did pretty well with for understanding and, and material delivery. But I, I'm not going to wait for perfection to try and just do things. It's time to start doing things. For me anyway. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully it had information that kept you entertained. And perhaps uh, it gave you some value. And... Um, it's, it's giving some extra meaning, perhaps, to what Mr. Barrett may have been intending. At any rate, uh, that's all for today. I'll talk to you later.